This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris. Today, our special guest is Jordan Levine. Jordan is a senior economist at the California Association of Realtors, a statewide trade organization of real estate professionals with more than 190,000 members. Jordan started in the research and economics department of CAR in 2016 as senior economist at CAR. Jordan analyzes housing market conditions, macroeconomic trends, and public policy issues through the use of external data from the public and private sector and from survey researches studied by, conducted by CAR. So, Jordan, welcome to our show. Hey, thanks for having me. Looking back, how would you categorize 2018 for California real estate? Yeah, it was a a tough year. I mean, as we forecasted kind of at the beginning of the year, we thought there was going to be some headwinds. And, in fact, the year ended off on a a relatively somber note with sales uh, on the decline. In fact, in the last couple of months of the year, we actually saw sales go down by double digits, which – you know, sales have been struggling for a long time, but I think what's different as we got towards the tail end of 2018, and and one of the things that we're expecting to continue into this year is just that there's a seems to be a demand side component to this issue now, where you know home sales haven't been doing great for the last couple of years to begin with, but it was pretty much all attributable to a lack of supply until we got to 2018, and then we saw listings start to come back. Uh, and despite that, we're still seeing sales go down. And so that it's no longer just the supply constraint holding the market back. And I think that was the big shift in, in 2018. You know, it's interesting. Do you think that demand, um, the expectation that demand would be there if there was inventory, do you, do you think that might have been a miscalculation in the sense that if you had demand that was excessive, over supply you probably would have had a really serious price increase but we didn't that's right yeah and i think you know the we knew rates were going to go up and we know that obviously puts a pinch on affordability that's for sure but you know one of the calculations we were making at the end of last year was look the economy is in good shape and in fact it continued to be in relatively good shape all through 2018 and and we have such a big structural deficit in terms of the supply of housing out there that we thought we're turning out enough of these high wage jobs that even though you know a lot of folks won't be able to achieve that dream of home ownership last year that there was still a lot of folks wanting to get into the market that should have been able to and i think that um, you know you can't really underestimate the consumer confidence element of of the housing market i mean it's one of the biggest purchases that any household's ever going to make in their life and i think that um, even more than a lot of other industries that kind of those question marks, that consumer confidence, the psychology out there on the part of buyers really uh, plays into this. So even in the face of, you know, very historically low levels of unemployment, all-time high levels of jobs, that you still had folks who are maybe worried about which way the market's going or have just been completely priced out because of the rate, you know, rates and, and higher prices that we've seen over the last couple of years. And I think both of those factors really undermine sales in the second half of the year, that there was, you know, still a, a, a relatively healthy economy, and yet folks were a little bit trepidatious about jumping into the market. And you see that in the competitiveness statistics as well, that it's no longer just a supply-driven issue. You know, you had mentioned the longer range cycle. So 400,000 sales for California is not really what we've done in the past. So in the cycles that we had that say ended in 89, uh, 2006, we had sales that were, uh, really high and it, it took like four years of really aggressive sales to peak out in sales. In this cycle, we haven't had a peak. We just haven't, we've had all boring, all boring years. What, what do you attribute that to? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of sad when you think about it. Cause if I show, you know, when I go out on the road and do these speeches, I show the, the graph for jobs and the graph for unemployment, the jobs one's going straight up, the unemployment one's coming straight down, and yet we basically have had flat home sales for the better part of the last seven, eight years. And and again, the economy is doing well. People want housing, but I think we're butting up against this 
this multiple decades long supply constraint. I mean, if you look at the state's estimates, they think we need 180, almost 200,000 units built every year just to kind of tread water on affordability, not even to be able to start reversing course on the, on the challenges that we have. And unfortunately we haven't come anywhere near that since 2008, you know, since we've been down in the, in the recession and even before, and, and we haven't built at that level going back even before the, the downturn. And, and so unfortunately we just have this economy that continues to boom and nowhere to house these people. And so that the housing market that we have goes to, to the highest bidder. And as a result, you don't have as many folks who are able to jump into the market. And you also don't have folks who are really excited about selling because they might have a lot of equity built up in their home. But yet, if they have to turn around and become a buyer in the same market, um, it all kind of comes out in the wash. And in some cases, you give up things like property tax you know, benefits that you, you've accumulated over time. And I just think that, that the overall supply constraint is really discouraging both you know, sellers and, and also eroding the affordability, which in turn pushes buyers out. Okay. Well, it's interesting you say that. So affordability really is at 27%. Historically, that's not really low for California. It's not at an all-time low, but, you know, unfortunately what it means is that, you know, almost 80% of, of households out there can't afford the average home, and, and that becomes really problematic when you think about it from the standpoint of growing home ownership uh, and things like that. And so, uh, yes, it did get down into the teens back in 2005-06 time frame, which was, you know, it, that was an all-time low, but just because we haven't hit those those extraordinary lows, it's still um, – way down from where it was. I mean, back in 2009, it was a historic opportunity, I think, for folks to get in where half of Californians could afford that average house. And, and that's been more than cut in half just, just during the course of this cycle. So in 80 and 89, we reached 17% affordability, did that again in 2005. So, you know, that's a more realistic historical number for California. Do you think that we're going to reach that level this time? Or do you think we have not enough uh, energy in the market to go go there. Yeah, I think when you look at the demand side of the equation, we are expecting price growth to slow. We look at things like listing price growth because that tends to lead what we see on closed sales by anywhere between four and six months. And if you look at that number, it looks like price growth is poised to dip into that low single digit range. And 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 so we don't think there's going to be a big decline in home prices, but we do think that they're uh, going to peter out as, as some buyers are in a kind of wait see mode. One of the things that's interesting, I, I, I looked at one of your presentations and it, it talked about the misconceptions that buyers have, even at this point, about the financing that's available and the down payment required. Can you Can you address that? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm still optimistic about the market. I mean, California's had a really challenging market for many, many years, and, and yet there's still folks out in the industry making money and being successful. And, and, and I think that's one area of both challenge for realtors and the community going forward, but also an opportunity because when we do our survey research, we find that, you know, 30 or 40 percent and think that you need at least 30 percent or more in terms of a down payment just to get into the market. And I think another 20 to 30% think you need at least 20% or more. And so a lot of folks haven't heard about opportunities to get into housing with relatively low down payments. And you look at the median price here in California, which is like 550 or got up to 600 during the summer. Uh, and folks are looking at that and thinking, well, I don't have $200,000 sitting in my, in my savings account. You know, home ownership isn't an option. And so even in these challenging conditions, you know, one of the things that we know and have seen consistently in up markets and down markets is that people still want to, you know, become homeowners. That's still synonymous with the American dream. And so even with all the challenges out there of these higher prices, higher rates, less affordability, we know that people want to get into housing. And in fact, when we ask folks who, who thought you needed these big giant down payments to become a homeowner, would you get into housing if, if you could get in with a smaller down payment? Almost 70 percent said, yes, they would. Uh, unfortunately, about 70% had never heard about things like FHA and other low down payment loan options. And so I think, again, even in these challenging times, there's opportunities to peel folks off into home ownership by, by some good targeted education out there. Yeah, you know, when you're in the industry and you're around it all the time, the assumption is everybody knows that. And then when you really realize, wow, they, they actually don't realize that that, uh, 
that does become a big issue where you think, okay, well, how do we, how do we get that information out? Um, rent increases have been crazy in the last five years. So do rent increases spur buying activity or does it spur out migration? I think both. I think you're seeing both the desire for folks to kind of um, circumvent the constant increases in rents that have gone on by getting into housing. But I also think you're seeing a lot of, of exodus from California. In fact, the, the census recently released numbers for 2017, and it looks like that out migration trend continues to accelerate. So we've been uh, in the six figures for the last five years, I think, in a row where more than 100,000 people have left the state. And I think that that number is getting bigger. I think it was like 130 or 140,000 last year. And unfortunately, you know, again, that's part of the downside of people wanting that American dream and still wanting home ownership is that in some cases, uh, and it looks like in increasing numbers, they're willing to go out of California to achieve that. What's interesting is we're, we're losing the domestic migration game, but winning the immigration game. So why the disconnect there? Yeah, I think if you look at the the, the demographics of, of who's leaving, it really does come down to, to a housing story. I mean, the, the folks who are leaving California, the vast majority of those folks make under $100,000 a year. Um, and, and the folks who are coming in tend to have higher incomes. And so there's folks who, you know, like California's climate and livability and the quality of life that you get here and are in a position to be able to kind of stomach the, the high cost of housing. And then you've got folks who, who can't afford the high cost of housing need to go elsewhere uh, in order to achieve that same quality of life. I mean, it's, it's interesting when you think about all of the, the criticisms of California, of which there are many valid ones, um, you know, but you hear about our tax rates being the thing that's driving folks out. But in fact, it's the, the folks on the lower end of the income spectrum who benefit most from California's super progressive tax structure who are actually being forced to leave. That tells me that it's not just taxes, but it's things like um, the cost of housing, which they're really having to stretch to to make happen. In many cases, can't afford home ownership as a, uh, evidenced by the fact that you know, we haven't seen that rebound in, in the home ownership rate here in California like we have in many other parts of the nation. Um, one of the other statistics that was of interest to me and I was a little bit shocking was the, the high percentage of sellers that leave the state. Now, they, they were here, enjoyed the price increase, and when they cashed in their chips, you know, three out of ten said, we'll see you later. So what do you think the main reason for them leaving is? Yeah, I think there's definitely a, a tax component there. I think there's just the cost of housing in other states makes a, a retirement look more attractive. If you can cash out a significant amount of equity and go somewhere and pay cash or have a very small mortgage and put lots of that equity in your bank to use as your kind of uh, you know monthly cash flow, then, then that's uh, an attractive option for a lot of folks. You know, one of the things when you're – when you deal with the – let's say qualifying, we're, we're about to teach a seminar and we talk about the budget. And I, and I spoke to lenders about what they consider uh, when they're figuring out somebody qualifies. And there are two categories that aren't on their charts. They do not consider daycare costs as a standard regular cost, like an, like an automobile payment. And they don't consider health care cost. And those two items have grown pretty big. So even though the lenders don't consider it, I bet the person that's saying, I can't afford that mortgage is considering it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the the fact of the matter is, I think that we're, we're spread pretty thin across every category. You know, prices have gone up faster than uh, incomes. Rents have gone up faster than incomes. Healthcare costs and, and all of these other costs continue to outpace incomes. And so even though uh, you know, folks are are doing better than they were five, six, seven years ago. Uh, you know, they're not really able to pull ahead because, they're, you know, it's just this ongoing battle to kind of keep up with with ever increasing costs. Uh, the raising of interest rates, um, you know, I've, I've been around since interest rates were 17 and a half. I refinanced the house one time at 17 and a half. So when somebody tells me that this is a high interest rate environment, I, I do have to smile a little bit going, you have no idea. Sure. But the impact of it going up, it can do one of two things. It can discourage people or it can actually spur activity. So which of these things do you think is occurring? 
Yeah, I think when you saw rates come down as they have over the last couple of weeks, we have seen a pretty big surge in mortgage applications. And so I do think that uh, that can get some buyers off the, the fence. But I do think with how much prices have risen, it's also, um, you know, at the margin for some people to either look for cheaper housing, of which there isn't much to speak of uh, in California, or wait and try and uh, get in a better financial position or wait and see what happens with home prices. And so I think you're seeing, um, you know, both things happen at the same time. I always joke that my dad, you know, used to drag me around in the eighties bragging about his 12 and a half percent mortgage rate. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I agree that it's, it's not the absolute level of, of interest rates that are going to submarine the housing market. I think, you know, at 5% in historical terms, it's still, um, you know, very affordable to use other people's money to buy real estate. But at the same time, you know, we, we also are in the midst of this affordability crunch, and that really is the double whammy because we're coming off the back of multiple years of 7, 8, 9, 10% price growth, depending on what market you're in. And then you're talking about a 50 to 100 basis point increase uh, in rates, and, and that really makes that cost of home ownership not go up just by the 8 or 9% that your home prices went up, but maybe more like 14 or 15% once you absorb the higher rates as well. Right. Um, the Fed has raised uh, short-term rates eight times in two years, uh, but the 10-year T-bill today is 2.7%. So it, why the disconnect between the long bonds and the short bonds? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that the thing to keep in mind about the long end of the yield curve is that, you know, it's it's really influenced largely by, you know, global capital flows and unfortunately or fortunately for better or worse the the u.s still remains a, a safe haven and i think that folks are are you know putting money into uh longer term bonds there's just a glut of of savings out there outside the u.s where there's lots of wealth being created and and in a lot of cases it makes sense to park that money in the united states especially not just if you think that uh, the U.S. is going to be stable, but if you think that you face your own domestic exchange rate risk, then it makes bonds and treasuries look relatively uh, attractive. That's why the Fed, you know, it, it bleeds through, and you have seen long-term rates go up a bit, but it's definitely not a one-for-one -for -one transfer because uh, the Fed isn't the one holding all the cards when it comes to long-term rates. Do you feel there'll be an inverted yield curve occurring in 2019, and do you attach any significance to that? I mean, that's been a, a pretty reliable predictor of recession. Um, you know, we have seen those short-term rates go up. I do think that the Fed wants to do another rate increase because they want more kind of rounds in the chamber, if you will, to, to fight the next recession with. Um, but they're also cognizant of the fact that they don't want to, you know, overdo it and, and invert that that yield curve. I think the thing to keep in mind is that, yes, the, the expansion, the current expansion that we're in is very long by historical standards. You typically don't see, you know, 10 year long expansions. But at the same time, uh, recessions don't just happen out of nowhere. You know, I think that the yield curve is definitely a good indicator to watch. But the yield curve inverting isn't necessarily uh, a cause a causal factor that drives a recession. It's more of an indicative uh, indicator that we used to see how overheated the economy is and what the short-term risks are. And so, you know, I think I'm looking for a, a shock to happen to, to drive a recession, not for the economy just to go into recession out of the blue. Uh, but I do think that the fact that yield curve did invert slightly a couple of weeks ago is suggestive of the, of the fact that the economy might be running uh, a little bit hot, and there's worries about, you know, short term. What effect do you think the Fed reducing its balance sheet is going to have? Yeah, I mean, it's going to, you know, take some of the liquidity uh, out of the, the housing market, especially the unwinding of all these, you know, these MBSs. But I think that that'll help to, uh, you know, keep rates from going up uh, like crazy anyway they're going to buy back a lot of these things put some more money in the in the system and, and that's why you know we're i think relatively conservative when it comes to our interest rate forecast where you have things ending up somewhere around you know five and a quarter or so this year versus some folks who you know initially at least were forecasting much higher rates this year usually when we've got a recession the, the fed has four to five percent uh interest rate deductions on the short end 
to help things out. And if we don't get to 3% before that happens, what does the Fed do? Do we get into negative interest rates or do we have more quantitative easing or do we just have a terrible recession? Yeah, I think you'll have a, a combination of both. I think they're going to have to get creative, and that's why they're going to be out, you know, having to do things. I guess it depends on the nature and severity um, of the recession and where the intervention, you know, is needed. If it's on like the corporate or commercial real estate side or corporate debt side, it, it really depends. Um, banks don't seem like they're engaged in tons of risky lending activities at this point, so I don't think it's going to be the same flavor of a of intervention that we need, but I think that, you know, they're going to have to look at, at more creative ways of, of using their balance sheet like they did last time around if things get bad enough. Are you concerned about the corporate debt structure? Just curious. I'm a little bit worried about the, the corporate structure. I mean, if you look at the financial obligations ratio, it's still very low, which suggests that the economy is not in bad shape, but that's a function of these, uh, you know, very low rates. We know that there's, um, you know, a lot of these kind of balloon loans that are going to come due in the next couple of years on the commercial real estate side. And so, you know, for me, I think that when you just look at the the bigger picture on the corporate side and, and where these equities are at, valuations are at relative to the amount of corporate profits that are being generated. Um, you know, yes, we did get a bit of a reprieve last year. I think that's largely due to the the bump in in profits associated with reduced taxation uh, associated with tax reform, but that's a, a kind of one-time jump up that, that then it's going to be back to firm performance from here on out. And unfortunately, the I think if you look at things like the Wilshire 5000, they're you know, 15 times the, the value of all the corporate profits out there, and, and that's relatively high. It's not an all-time high, but you know, companies are, are worth about 15 times the amount of money that they're making, and, and usually it's around you know, 10. So, okay. Um, if that starts to unwind, then I think it has implications for the broader economy and, and definitely for, for the housing market through the wealth effect and also just on the demand side. I mean, we're seeing demand wane a little bit now with very low levels of unemployment. So if, if these companies, you know, wake up one day and realize they're not worth as much as they thought they were and have to, you know, cut jobs and we see unemployment start to go up, then we've really got a bigger issue on the demand side of the equation. Okay. I've uh, got about a minute left. Anything outside the world of real estate that concerns you? Outside of the stock market, I think that's that's the big one. I mean, I think for me, uh, the key is to to not panic. I mean, the the thing that I've been advising realtors is to um, get your get your clients focused more on on the long term. Right, their rates are still low. It's a great time to lock in a uh, thirty year fixed rate. I don't think we'll be back in the three and a half percent range anytime soon the other thing is we know people still want to buy and own their own homes and there's an opportunity again through the education piece to to make that happen even in challenging times and the third thing is just that over the long term real estate is still a good bet i did this speech the other day with a guy who's been a realtor for you know 35 40 years and he totally blew me out of the water because he came in and just said you know look When's the best time to buy real estate? Well, it was 20 years ago. But you know what? The second best time to buy real estate is today. <laughs> and I think that's an important message for folks, you know, because over the long term, the market may go up or down over the next couple of years. And, and there's a lot of question marks out there. Um, but if you can get into a home that you can afford that payment on and and can get in at these low rates, then you have an opportunity to, to do really well by your family's balance sheet and by the next generation in terms of accumulating wealth and, and saving off further rent increases and, and all of that good stuff. And so even in these challenging times, I think there's a lot of reasons for buyers and sellers to be in the market. Uh, I think us as a real estate community are going to have to hustle in 2019. We can't throw it in cruise control and expect things to happen uh, automatically, but I think, you know, if we get out there and do what we've had to do for the last five or six years anyway, which is to hustle and make it happen and carve out your own market share and you continue to do that, then I still think 2019 can be a great year. Well, Jordan, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your input and uh, look forward to 2019. Hey, thanks for having me. Okay. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com.